Politics in Singapore had been dominated by a single dominant party with a tiny opposition trying to provide checks and balances. Governance was hardly an issue. However, in the last decade, cracks in government showed up with increasing frequency and serious questions about the competence of government have now arisen. We need a new vision to move Singapore forward. Today, a group of concerned and committed Singaporeans have come together to write a new narrative for Singapore. This narrative is spelled out in our manifesto. We are a diverse team of individuals each with at least 15 to 20 years of working experience in our areas of expertise. After this conference, we will register ourselves as a new political party to pursue our objective. Of the 11 founding members, eight have previously worked in government agencies, Seven are scholarship recipients, four are former grassroots leaders, and three are ex PAP activists. We are therefore familiar with issues of governance at both national and local levels. We will provide an alternative platform for Singapore and Singaporeans. Four of the original 15 are on business outside Singapore. The remaining seven are here in front of you to answer, including Fami, who is stuck. There are six of us here, uh, but he will join us soon. The remaining are here, if remaining seven are here in front of you to answer any questions that you may have about us or our proposed party. I will give a brief induction on each of them. Starting from my far right, David, David Fu, he's a chemist with a PhD from American University uh, and had a, and studied on an American government scholarship in the Department of Energy. So he has worked in multinational corporations and he's a logistics professional. So, and an ex-PAP, uh, young PAP, ex-young PAP. So, he's not new to politics. Um, so, the more in the bio data. Next to me, directly next to me, is Fatima. Fatima is an architect, and she has worked and lived in 11 countries, so recently Dubai and Tokyo. So she uh, quite, you know, she got lots of experiences about how workers are treated in other countries, their employment practices. So she's a, a very good member of the team, because moving forward, I think jobs and employment for Singaporeans are key. And to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Ang, who needs no introduction, so he has been with me since the, the two, well, 40 years ago. <laughs> and he, he was also active in the 2011 general election. So he's a psychiatrist in medical uh, practice, of private practice, and ex Agi Kerner, uh, been dead, and ex grassroots leader for many years, uh, 20 over years uh, in the uh, June. Winston Lim is an architect and also a town planner. Uh, went to do a masters in MIT, Massachusetts, and Ivy League University on a URA scholarship. So, and to my left is Jamie. Jamie is an SAP, you know, uh, German company is a project manager in the IT line. 
and all of us are committed. The other four, and you'll be surprised, three of them are grandfathers. Mm. Three of the four are grandfathers, and I'm very glad that they're so committed to come. One of them has got six grandchildren, so you know. So this is our, this is our answer to the pioneers package. <laughs> All right. Uh, I now have pleasure to invite you to ask any questions that you have. I have circulated the manifesto to you earlier on. Uh, if you have not read that, you can still read that. Uh, members will press the door ready, or do you want to read it? I can. Uh, these are the things here. With all the biodata, all photos in uh, color as well. All right. Uh, I'm now open to the floor. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm Conrad from the Independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, my question. Um, I just, you all know that you're from SDP. Yeah. And the key question is um, why did you go to SDP? And um, if not SDP, um, there was also a talk of coalition uh, right after the GP 2011 elections. Yeah. Um, so, do you still have a plan to bring all the parties together and um, what's the time frame for that? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you have asked the most important question up front. Um, joining an existing party would be an easy way out for me. I have taken the hard road and we are all embarked on this difficult journey ahead. I am very grateful to the SDP for giving me the opportunity and the platform to, co to compete in the 2011 general election. Not just the general election, some of them are still here, are here with me. They also helped me in the presidential election that was held nearly four months later. So did a lot of other parties, NSP, SPP, uh, even some members of the Workers' Party too came. So, I want to work with all of them. They also want me to work with all of, of them. And obviously they want me to join their party. I decided that to, it is better that I form my own party, which will allow me to help to work with all parties and not just one party uh, in the coming general election. And this is a key point. We will work with every one of them I am still very keen, Kumaran, on forming a coalition with all the other parties, with all parties. In fact, immediately after this, talk, uh, after this, after today, we will talk to the other parties. In fact, I raised talk, started talking to some of them about working together. We know that a united opposition is key because we are meeting with a mammoth opponent. Uh, we will work towards that. We will work towards that, and uh, I think it's important that with this new uh, with this new organization, we are able to paint, to write a new narrative for Singaporeans, to give an alternative vision. So, previously, uh, in regards to the of that we were meeting with the Singapore People's Party as well as other parties. Could you name some of the parties that you've already talked to and uh, what were the response? Yeah, I actually was at the NSP dinner last night. So I spoke to them as well. Several of them came up to congratulate me and express desire to work together. And I have also told them, yes, why don't we do that, you know? We will work together. Maybe we can work towards a common platform, a common agenda. And uh, and try to work out the constituencies, helping each other out, beating each other's team. It's not having an additional opposition party doesn't mean the end of cooperation. It may, well, if it leads to consolidation, why not? It's better. You know, since uh, the presidential election in 2011, can you just elaborate a bit on the kind of work you have been doing? What have you been involved in uh, grassroots uh, Why? Or even if you haven't, uh, you need to still an update. Uh, yeah, since, obviously since the presidential election, I have been involved more. It's trying very much to talk to people, getting together, finding the ground. Where, what should I do? In fact, talking to a lot of existing parties. 
whether I can, whether that is the best way forward and how we get together. And after two years of talking and all that, so this is the result. I have also done on my on a personal basis, and which is also very good for for the political landscape in Singapore. I have been given a lot of talks outside Singapore. You know, in Singapore, to be invited to public talks is a bit difficult uh, for the opposition. So I have gone out. I've been spoken. I was invited as an election observer in the U.S. presidential election of 2012, which was sponsored by the State Department, U.S. State Department. They really well let me visit all the places the polling stations, how they conduct elections, what the strategies are. So I am very grateful to the US State Department. It's fantastic exposure, uh, once in four years. So I did that and I went to, uh, you know, electronic voting and all that. After that, I uh, was invited to Peking University to speak at Peking University on population, economic growth and quality of life. So I thought it was quite good. and. Um, and after that, actually I came, I was also appointed by Oxford University as a visiting fellow at the Department of Social Policy and Inter Intervention. And I've written a lot on my, on my Facebook about my trip, about welfare society, you know, social policy, which I am sure is also what interests the, the government here. They have been talking about social policy. I, have, I hope my postings have helped, contributed to their thinking that all these are not a bad thing. If they are a bad thing, they would not have done it now. Huh? Uh, to clarify their thoughts on welfare state, which is not a dirty word, because if it's a dirty word, so why are so many countries embracing it? And they are doing very well. Uh, that's one thing. And after that, uh, yeah, I was invited to Berlin to speak at an international conference. It is the biggest conference of in, the, in the world of scholars on the subject of welfare state. And I was there to give a, a, a speech as well on Singapore's experience and how we could learn from the experience of the Nordic states. So, uh, and since, I, since then, I have also been active locally, SMU talks, um, and meeting up with friends. In fact, I have been busy since last year, meeting with some of my core group members, discussing about whether to join the existing party, which one to join, and whether to form a new party. And this is the result. Today's, uh, today's event is the result of efforts in the last one year, consistent con and intensified efforts over the last one year. It is not an overnight sensation, not an overnight event, and the logo of the heart is not something new or we copy from the local newspapers which have been talking about heart and love in the last few weeks. I mean, obviously my, my friends from the local newspaper would have been, you know, so we were very surprised to see heart all over the local newspapers. Yes? Um, yes, um, back to the coalition issue. Um, no, but she has been doing quite well. But do you think it's been doing relatively well in securing, you know, um, DRC and <clears throat> SMCC? So, um, do you think that this would somehow, you know, dilute the opposition vote, you know, in the next general election? And also, do you think that the party is ready to compete? The only party is ready to compete in the next general election, given that um, it's Probably about two years or less. You know, two years is a long time. In fact, Harold Wilson said one week is a long time in politics. Uh, I think two years is a very long time for us to prepare. I think we'll be ready for the next election. And I don't think we will necessarily split votes. It depends on how we work together. And I am sure. The Workers' Party has been very successful and I wish them very uh, well as well. They should continue to be successful and continue to do the good work that they are doing. But they are not going to contest all constituencies. They make it very clear that they are not going to form the government. So I don't think they will contest the majority of seats. So they will, there will be some seats left. There will be, I think, a lot of seats left. A lot of constituencies left for the others 
then we can cooperate with the others and uh, work out where we can stand without necessarily going into head-on collision with anybody and splitting board. But I, I must emphasize that, you know, this is not something to be afraid of. In 1959, PAP was engaged in all three, four corner fights, and yet they won. So it's not something to be worried about, but we will take it, you know, as it comes, but we will try as much as possible to cooperate. Um, okay, because of resources constraint as well, so some of your teammates, including yourself, Mr. Tan, have experience uh, contesting in certain GRCs like Holland, Bukit Timah. In order to, let's say, focus limited resources and experience um, for the next GE, can you give us an idea of, let's say, some of the areas perhaps that you all have already uh, perhaps started your work <laughs> in? Uh, I think. Uh, well, I think it's a bit early. We are not registered yet as a party. But we roughly, you know, if we don't want to go headlong with anybody, Tanjung Panga is available, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's... Um, yeah, don't have to, don't have to talk, just go. Uh, nobody will fight with you. Uh, no more, there, won't, I, there will be no walkover. Okay, and what about, let's say, you know, you were saying that um, avoiding, let's say, a three-party, you know, hit-on competition is not really an issue, so uh, there will be some areas with that where that's inevitable. How are you going to deal with, let's say, you know, um, hurt feelings or, let's say, uh, the other parties who perhaps might see it as their term? Well, I'm sure we will, two years, we have two years to talk. So we will try to work out something. I think it is not in the interest of the opposition or not in the interest of politics that, you know, to put ego above the country. And I think the determination of political parties to win hope will, I think, override all the uh, egoistic or the party constitution. Uh, welcome, Fami. So let me, uh, okay. Let me introduce Fami to you. Fami is actually uh, those in the com Malay community will be very familiar with Fami. He started uh, the free to air and channels and uh, cable TV, uh, Malay, uh, yeah, Sur Sur Surya and all that. So he, uh, I'm very glad that he could join us. I think he was also with the young KB. He was. Chairman of a young PAP branch in Angmokyo. So it's, uh, I'm very glad that he's joining us. And uh, for many years, a PAP activist in Angmokyo, chairman of a, uh, a young PAP. And he's also in broadcasting, in media, in brand, uh, branding, and all that. I think he's uh, an excellent addition to our team. Okay, where were we? We're talking about uh, constituencies. Uh, I'm sure we'll work something out. I mean, uh, I think from the Congo East experience, you know that if you are determined to win and if you are determined to put the interests of the opposition of the country ahead of you, I think uh, you will be prepared to back up. Uh, which I think the SDP did a wonderful thing of backing up and then leaving a field for WP and WP won. <coughs> Um, we here we have enough people to form two GRC to contest you with GRC. Wow. Um, so after this announcement, we expect more to join us, more to join us. And you remember Dr. Ang in the last 2011 election saying that we are the first wave and there will be more waves in future. In fact, a number of people have approached me already to, to join. I say, well, let's get registered first and then we'll join. We are confident of getting a lot of uh, good candidates as well, depending on the number that we can attract. 
Uh, I think we can safely say that we will go for minimum two or even three or even four GRCs. And I think we can work together with uh, everyone. And there are, there are certain constituencies which are, uh, which are available. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask some questions regarding your policy outlook. Okay. Um, what's your stand on? I mean, one one thing that's currently trending is CPF. Whether we should have state-run pension programs or is there going to be a move for privatized it? That's one. Second is your party's position on welfare, social welfare programs, and um, what's your differentiator? First with DAP and with the other opposition parties. Yeah. Um, I think does anyone want to take or oh, I've been talking a lot so but the it's quite clear cut. If you had you read the manifesto, it's quite clear cut where our social policy is, where our stand on welfare is, where our stand on CPF is. I think CPF is an inadequate instrument for retirement savings. I mean, more than half do not have the minimum sum. We need something to supplement, and I have put down, we have put down in the manifesto an age, an old age pension scheme. Old age pension scheme, okay? Uh, we want a strong safety net, which will prevent Singaporeans from falling into insecurity, despair, and indignity. You know, this Kiasu mentality. It, this safety net must have three elements. Firstly, a truly affordable, universal, and comprehensive healthcare insurance. Number two, an unemployment insurance. And third, an old age pension provided by the state outside of the inadequate CPF. I think we are very different from the DAB in this respect. Okay? Unemployment insurance, old age pension, Healthcare, they talk about affordable, you know, but it's not really truly affordable. What they have got, the government pays only one third of health spending in Singapore. Two thirds are paid out of pocket by us, the citizens. We want to change this to the other way around. Government to pay two thirds and people to pay only one third at most. The health minister said that he will raise it to 40%, from 30 to 40%. I think this is grossly inadequate. It is not first world. It is definitely not first world. First world has got much higher. In fact, some of the third world countries have got much higher share for the government. Well, then we uh, change the foreign worker, worker quota and policy. The government has already been responding. Will there be further changes in your proposal? Yeah, definitely. I don't think it's... Uh, you know, the government likes to use this word, they want to calibrate. They have been calibrating for so many years. And have they achieved anything? Have they been successful with calibration? All these passwords, you know, what do they mean? What does password mean? Is it effective, you know? It is obviously not effective. We are still having overpopulation. Productivity is so low. You look at the latest, it's only 0 0.9. In the first uh, first quarter of this year, when the finance minister in 2010 said uh, have a new productivity plan, he wants to achieve three percent productivity growth. So far, since that, it's just so flat. It is less than one percent. So we are already almost halfway there. Can he achieve it? He is not the first minister who will fail, who has failed to achieve productivity. In fact, the Prime Minister started in 1985, the Chairman of the Economic Committee, talking about productivity growth and what has he achieved after nearly 30 years, right? In the, yeah, 85 to now 2014, nearly, yeah, 29 years, nearly. Has he achieved anything on productivity? We spent billions of dollars on productivity movement, training and skill, and lots of air time, newspaper time, talking about space, talking about productivity, has he achieved anything? Has he achieved the goal that he set out to achieve? After 30 years, have we not given him enough time to prove himself? What has he proven on productivity after 30 years? And after spending billions and billions of dollars on trading? 
And now Taiwan has taken over, this performance is just below par. Yeah. The second differentiator between us and the PUP is putting people first. In fact, if you look at a logo, it's symbolic of a hate, the hate outside. The circle represents the hate, and then the heart inside. So we are a party which think with our heart. It's a paradox here. Huh? We think with our heart. Heart is not for thinking, heart is for feeling. So we don't just think with our brains. The BAB has been thinking, thinking, thinking with their brains all these years. The old narrative may work in the first 40 years, but the old narrative is not working. Because we need to put people in the center. And if you look at the manifesto, we talk about a fair society. We talk about strong, robust economy. Yeah, we must have economic growth. But we talk about strong family. And finally, in our manifesto, we talk about esteemed people. You notice we didn't say confident people. As a psychiatrist, let me illustrate the difference between confidence and esteem. Confidence is doing, speaking well, doing a project well, performing well. Confidence is for the world to see, you do for the world to see. A confident player, a confident singer, a confident worker. But esteem is inside you, your worth, your identity, your image of yourself, your self-worth, and it's inner you, it's inside you. The esteem, we feel that Singaporeans are no longer feeling esteemed and walking around with dignity with a head high. We are, because of cost of living, because of foreign workers all over the place, because of congestion, because of limited infrastructure, we feel constrained. And with the CPF talk now going on, we feel, even in our retirement, we feel stressed. So where is the esteem? And we have the dubious title of being the most stressed, the unhappiest, and the least emotional people in the world. So what's the point of economic growth and the expense of not building self-esteem in your people? Every person in Singapore counts. And the strong country looks after the weakest people in the country. Not an elitist mentality. The governance of the past must be changed. They, are, they keep changing the building, but the foundation, the core values remain the same. We need to look at meritocracy all over again, otherwise we will continue to have the elitist mentality. The scholars, the elitists ruling over us, not leading over us, ruling over us. We need leaders, real leaders with empathy. Professor Chan Heng Chi talked about the politics of empathy, the politics of love. Robin Chan yesterday, one whole article with the shape of a heart, talking about politics of the heart. So there is this move that the person is worthy and our party wants to make that difference. That's why you have an economist here, you have a psychiatrist here. We complement each other extremely well. <laughs> okay. May I just read to you the first paragraph of our manifesto, which sums up what, Dr. what we are all talking about, what Dr. is talking about. Actually, the title of my manifesto is Fair society, strong families, and esteemed people. People are important. They are the soul of a nation. For the past 50 years, Singaporeans have become secondary to the relentless pursuit of economic growth. The nation has lost its soul. We need a new vision that puts Singaporeans at the heart of the nation. The vision of a fair society with strong families and a confident people with high self-esteem the visions of Singaporeans first. That's our vision. I just want to ask, um, um, 
the other what the other opposition parties are offering, what do you have to offer, you know, what value do you have beyond what they are offering? Uh, David, do you want to say something? What you are offering? Or okay. Anybody else? I I think obviously um, we were our differentiation is in quite putting people at the heart of everything. I mean, there are a lot of specific ideas like. You know, a fair society being a strong safety net. People talk about safety net, but uh, what do they mean? The PAB is still struggling. What is safety net is? Right? They say, will they go this one, will do this? Pioneer package only for those who are 65. But health costs actually affects everybody, not just the pioneers, uh, those above 65. I mean, we should have a system that gives, that addresses the issue of health costs for everybody, not just for the pioneers. You know, obviously they they, uh, they are important. So are the others. Not just being old makes you very important. Obviously, you are valued for your own experience. But what about the others? So you should not divide the nation in that way. So very specific, we want to remove the GST uh, because GST is unfair, it imposes an unfair burden on the lower and middle class of Singapore. And we want to take a look at economic growth, let's say foreign workers, why are we favoring certain industries like the shipyards with such a high percentage of uh, dependence on foreign workers? You know, 100,000 foreign workers out of a total workforce of 120,000, that's a lot. Why are you favoring the shipyards? What about other industries? Right? Are we going to distort our manpower policy just because of the shipyards? We are also talking about the CPF, as I told you, the OH pension. And obviously people will ask, do you have the money to support all this thing? I will just give you a figure. The OH pension, Let's say 250 a month per person. Over 12 months, $3,000 per person. How many people are we talking about? Half a million? The pioneers are 450,000. They came out with a figure of 450,000. So let's say if you include those who are 60 years old, not just bring back qualifying age to 60. Let's say we have half a million, half a million people, 500,000 people on age, old age pension. 3,000 a month. 500,000 people, meaning $1.5 billion a year. We can afford it. Every election time, they give you a GST vouchers of billions of dollars. So we can afford it without playing with vouchers, GST vouchers. We have worked out, we have, uh, we have humongous financial surpluses, right? Massive financial surpluses. And we, are, we have enough to pay for all this thing. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So I just wanted to follow up on that. Yeah. Even you want to increase social spending, and you want to do away with GST. Yeah. So are you just going to rely on the surpluses to fund all these programs? Well, I think basically we have to be. If you, I have estimated the surpluses to be quite a lot. So. A conservative estimate of one trillion dollars. We don't have to take the principal amount, we can take the returns. Even if you are talking about six percent return, you are talking about sixty billion dollar a year return. You have that much of money to spend without touching the principal amount. I think I want to move uh, so your GST, how much? It was ten billion dollar last year. Right? GST ten billion dollar. Uh, Talking about even outside the reserve, we talk about last year's budget surplus of over $30 billion. Just last year's budget surplus of over $30 billion. We can afford to take away, remove the GST of $10 billion. Uh, I think Winston, my uh, our town planner, has come to say about uh, a uh, key part of our manifesto as well. Okay. 
So we also like to look into the needs of um, mothers, housewives, and seniors. And we feel that there are ways to create more self-contained communities within housing estates so that we minimize crisscross traveling or commuting to the island. These self-contained communities would house the necessary workshops, schools, preschools, childcare centers, clinics, hospitals, for example, so that we allow uh, members of this uh, community to have flexible work arrangements. So this is one of the features that we can study. Yeah. In terms of the party name Singaporeans first, uh, it's a term that uh, is familiar to Singaporeans with uh, arguments uh, in terms of immigration policies that went uh, against uh, uh, the huge immigration policies. So uh, could you elaborate on your party's position uh, in terms of immigration and the essence of this name Singaporeans first? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think I'd like to clarify. People would accuse us of being xenophobic with this Singaporeans first. Let me emphasize that Singaporeans here, we are talking about, we are putting emphasis on Singaporeans as people, not as economic digits. So we must, we must know the difference. You know? It's not just versus foreign workers. It is versus economic digits that the PAP is good for, treating everybody as an economic digit. But we are treating people with feelings, with interest as members of families with children to look after and all that. It is not against, it's not versus foreigners. It's versus economic digits. And obviously immigration, we are concerned with overcrowding. And I think it is basically the economic structure uh, I think we can do something. We are going to remake Singapore society. Uh, it's not a very long manifesto. I think it's worth reading, about four or five pages. 1,500 words is not much. Um, so it's where we set out economic growth, you know. Yeah. And we will put, you know, the economic policy orientation of this government is always on multinational corporations. We want, and after 50 years, I think it's about time that we grow our own timber, uh, develop our own local entrepreneurs, local managers, you know, like the, what the soft corners, the Japanese, the Taiwanese team. They got world brands, world beating brands. Right, Singaporeans, what do you have? MNC. Yeah, we are so proud of MNC. After 50 years, do we want to, are we, so, are we still so proud? I think we should be ashamed that we don't have Big names, we're just dependent on MNCs. We're just treating us here because of our low tax, our liberal immigrant policy. Do you think it's something to be proud of? It's, we will be more proud if we have our own local industries. And that's where our difference is. Of course, we will welcome the MNCs, but I think we want to shift the emphasis. So, it's going to be a sectoral focus for growth of certain industries? Well, I hope we will be more uh, proactive, you know. We can't direct the industries they go to. I mean, it will be up to them, the businessmen. I uh, would like to congratulate the team here. It may be 11. I hope that it's uh, 100. <laughs> and uh, Singaporean uh, have been uh, carbon for the last 50 years uh, based on the very high-handed uh, government which uh, used laws uh, to enforce everything uh, to the exclusion of nation building and uh, today even on the, even if you take the government's uh, so-called uh, economic based uh, kind of government uh, you will find that there's a lot of fraud. And uh, this fraud, they try to explain it away uh, based on the one-way uh, one way thinking that they are right all the time. And uh, we have, uh, in our society, 
In our society, we have very educated people. We have a lot of talent now. All this talent got nothing to say. We have lawyers, successful lawyers, successful architect, successful engineer, but they got nothing to say. Every day, we got to listen to this one-way talk. The one-way talk of, I'm the best. So, in, in, in terms of economic fundamental, we found that they are wrong. Today, Singapore is not a society where we are considered inventive, creative, able to come up with a net, with a world picking product. And this itself already tells you that PAP are wrong. The only economic fundamental I can see is that they get you, get, make, make the people, tax them heavily to provide the minimum public service. And all the extra cash that are collected over and above the requirement of a non-welfare state become surpluses. These surpluses at the end make them think of using it for all the egoistic projects which are lost by the billion. So I think uh, our new team will have a very big challenge to play. They have to attract the talent and make them make the talent that is not recognized uh, being recognized again and motivate them again to work for the good Singapore. And I hope that after today, there will be 100. Hey, thank you, thank you, Robert. So, actually, just to, you know, uh, what, thank you for emphasizing, uh, elaborating on that. There is one part where we can, you know, the opposition has contributed, and I don't think the government has acknowledged, is in the area of transport. The transport, new transport policy is a public admission of their failure, of that of that their transport policies have failed, right? And not only have they failed, they have also taken ideas from the opposition. And this are, you will know that the Workers' Party and the SDP have advocated this nationalization of ownership of assets of the transport companies. So here you are, the PAP will always say, you know, the opposite, they are good for nothing. But if, this, if they are really good for nothing, why are you taking their ideas as well uh, on, in the transport sector? We hope they do it well, uh, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. There's a lot still to be implemented. Um, at the end of the day, is that will we get a better service, transport service? Uh, it is remains to be seen. And what about fares? I read that someone said that you cannot expect better. You cannot expect fares to come down when you want better service. I think we can. We can if companies are prepared not to be so greedy and not to accumulate so much profits. I think the bus companies are having a lot of profits. If they can reduce profits, they can reduce fares and still give you better service. One area we would like to emphasize is fertility rate. It's persistently low, by one of the lowest in the world, comparable to Macau and Hong Kong, 1.2. We want to bring it above two, and to do so, it really has. We have got to be very drastic in our measures, including providing free education all the way to university, and making sure that it is not stressful to bring up a child in Singapore. And this link up to the point of esteem. If you have a lot of high esteem people who transmit proper values down the line, then it's a joy to bring up children. And childhood is not denied to our children. But if you have confident parents, no doubt, but low self-esteem, very insecure parents, then kiasu and trying to compare with their neighbors all the time, then we end up Difficult. It is so difficult. We end up with all the difficulties and all the stress of bringing up a child. So we are different here. We want to really, really go all out to promote, to increase the fertility rate. Uh, you want to say anything? For me, you want to say anything? Any questions? Uh, yeah. You will find that the manifesto is very different from the others. A lot of people will make motherhood statements, huh? you know, including the PAP, we will do this, we will uh, ensure that we will take care of the vulnerabilities, you know, all that. But the proof of the pudding is in the eating. 
Are you effective? Are you generous? Here we are, you know, uh, just giving to the pioneers and how much? The duties are still not known. So, Robert alluded to the fact that they keep on emphasizing on their economic model and in one way or no way. And we know that in, in the early years of nation building, they mentioned a lot of vulnerability. We are a small state, we are vulnerable. So you listen to us, we are the best people to govern the country. So vulnerability is one issue that we really got to look at. When you keep on saying we are vulnerable, we are vulnerable, you are actually saying we are insecure. And you are actually transmitting the insecurity down the line to the people. And the people just feel insecure. So that is one thing they got to think about. And we will shift that. And second is meritocracy. I have already alluded to it. And thirdly, Robert put it so well, everything is about money. They have monetized practically everything in Singapore, including salary of the minister, all the way down. So these, these are tenets, these are the foundations they have built on, and we got to explore those foundations, shake those foundations, and rebuild new foundations with a new narrative. And that's why we are here. I actually mentioned about Kiasu mentality in the manifesto. Maybe I'll just read the relevant part for those who the, the outside the press. A Kiasu mentality is bad for both the heart and the soul. It holds us back from venturing forth with spontaneity and audacity. Uh, what makes Singapore so Kiasu so lacking in self-esteem, so stressed out that we earn the triple dubious reputations of being the most stressed? the unhappiest and the least emotional people in the world. These are the three labels that international agencies have given us. The most stressed, the unhappiest, and the least emotional people in the world. Are they not sitting back and then reflecting on these things, the government? They just push it aside, you know, that they don't eat cheese and all that? It is the fear of failure. Because failure in Singapore exacts a heavy economic and social price. There is no safety net of any significance to provide assistance. Once a person loses a job, he loses everything. No unemployment insurance, no health care, no savings for retirement. All this adds up to emotional insecurity and a lowered sense of self-esteem. I mentioned to you the three basic elements that we want in the safety net. Truly affordable health care, unemployment insurance, this is something new. This is amongst us different. And an old age pension for all old people. You know? Even if you are rich, we will give it to you. But obviously we don't expect you to take it up, we expect you to contribute to society, uh, to charity. But because you are old, we give to you. We don't discriminate whether you we will there will be no means test. Old age pension? Yes, give it to you. And unemployment insurance. It is something that we want to look at too because globalization, economic restructuring is going on at a very fast pace. And the technology makes it difficult for people to adjust. So unemployment becomes a serious problem and I think that we should have unemployment insurance to ensure that for at least the first six months of unemployment they got something to protect themselves when they are looking for a job. And I don't think they need to... Uh, we can work out all kinds of schemes. It doesn't mean that you will be you'll be given benefit forever, you know, or you'll be given an unlimited amount of salary, there'll be a cap. And obviously, if the ministers are retrenched, we, don't, we are not going to give, pay them $1 million uh, public benefit. So, yeah, I don't think they deserve it. Uh, so, if they're unemployed, if they become retrenched, and many of them will be uh, after the next election, but we will, there will be no unemployment benefit for them. So this is the one, unemployment benefit, I mean, pension. It, we can work at, there are so many models in the world. For six months you get maybe full salary, or maybe half salary. We can work out all kinds, it depends on what kind of premium we are prepared to pay. Premium paid for maybe 2-3% for the employee, another 2 3 percent by the employer, and maybe the government will top up another 2 3 percent or 5 percent. I think it is bearable. We have reached a stage of society where globalization, technology have put people at risk, enormous risk of employment risk. 
and we must protect them at least for six months. It's not much. We cannot give a million dollars to the ministers when they are unemployed. Uh, maybe, you know, medium wage of 3,800 a month. I think we can bear with that. We also would like to make the political landscape, the political culture of Singapore different. When you oppose the BAP, it doesn't mean you are anti-Singapore. You are still a full-blooded Singaporean, highly patriotic, and will die for your country. So opposing BAP does not equal opposing the country. We want to change the landscape. We have views, we must express it freely, without fear. And that's what we want to do. We come in here, we create this way, we hope more young people will join us, express views for the development of the country, for the good of the country, so that we can walk tall and proud and with high self-esteem. And the, when the world hear us, you're Singaporean, well done. You are really very outspoken, very daring, and very confident, esteemed people. Right at the moment, when you say you're Singaporean, wow, you are economically fantastic. But, well, other aspects, I'm not so sure. That's not what we want to be known in the world. We want to be known in the world as confident, esteemed people who are outspoken, who contribute ideas to nation building. Yeah, uh, we have been talking about it since last year. Uh, it started with a call group, obviously. I mean, Yoga and myself have been together for 40 years. You can say that this party has taken 40 years in the making. Um, we in the past, we say, well, let's form a PRB, People's Reaction Party, but that's the truth. This was the uh, student day, so it's not an overnight thing. We have been talking as a call group last year. I will tell you more, okay? We, David Tan is not here, David Tan, uh, David Tan was our teacher in Alai. So he was also very interested, we got together and um, then we met up with Tommy and uh, we're talking about, uh, because we know that the next election is coming around, we need to do, do something, but we want to do something. Tommy, then with Winston and Fatima, then slowly uh, we met and over the years we have decided Initially, maybe join an existing party, and later on, let's say, okay, maybe form new party. Form new party, we need at least minimum of ten to register as a party. So we have only five or six, so we have to look around for four more, four, five more. So that's how it became. And we want, we want to have a fair representation. We want a diverse group. You will notice that we are quite diverse. Um, so, but. The important thing is that all of us have got lots of working experience, so we know what we are talking about. Obviously, we welcome young people as well after this thing, but you will know that starting a party, you have to be familiar and comfortable with your fellow founding members. And I think we are very comfortable with each other after several months of meeting. We went later on to talk with David Fu and to Jamie, and uh, ah, there was another person, Tan Feng a retired colonel who has been together, colleague with him, for 20, 30 years, okay? And they also have been there. We also, I was also with them together. We all drink and all that. Um, so together, and when we talk, and Peng Han is a retired army colonel as well. He's not here, he's in Cambodia today. Uh, so we have been talking about it, and in fact, the surprising thing is that I met him at the airport in Helsinki. So he said, hey, let's meet up together. We're not in Helsinki, because Yong Kwan already told me that he was interested. So, and let's meet. So, say okay. He was on his way to Eastern Europe for holiday. I was on my way to where was I? London or Berlin. So, I met him at the transit. So, a lot of Singaporeans there. So, that's how when we came back, we talked, we met. And so, and he was here. I'm very glad. He's the grandfather with six grandchildren and still full of fire for Singapore to do something. 66 years old, six grandchildren. I said, wow, I really admire you. Okay, good. You know, it is not just the PAP who are who know about who think that they know about the problems of biomass. I think they don't. Who are their advisors? 
you have Mr. Goh Chong Tong as advisor to the uh, pioneers thing of the PP, and you have Madam Yi Fu. I mean, these people have got huge pensions, they got millions of dollars. What do they know about the, the sufferings, the pain of the pioneers who are not that wealthy? And I think people like that thing are people like uh, Michael Chia, who is another guy who is also 66 years old, helping out in an orphanage in uh, Vietnam right now. So he's all, I'm very glad, three grandchildren or two or three grandchildren. So coming up, and obviously they're not happy with the pioneers package. And I think we will challenge the PAP on that, whether they are really true to the, to the feelings, to the pain of the pioneers that the pioneers are going through. Do you expect a person like Mr. Bo Chok Kong, Madam Yi Fu, Minister who earns, who have lots of pension, uh, to, be, to be able to understand the vision, stomachs of these people, and who is the latest one? Is it Amy Ko or whatever? And Josephine, they are now saying that, oh, they must get a message across. Their message is not, I mean, what? You are creating this kind of message yourself, this kind of complications. It, if it is true, it comes from the heart. People will understand. Why do you make so many blocks, so many conditions before? It's a typical PAP means that they are not resolved internally their ideology towards social policies. They are struggling, struggling. In fact, I'm glad I, I read also an article today, Sunday Times, by my good friend, our good friend, Mr. Han Fu Kwok, about how the PAP, the government, is still struggling with this concept of social policy, how they are helping. I make it a point to complete normally, I don't read, I just read the first paragraph. But because he wrote a lot of he wrote a lot of things that I mean it's familiar ground to us. And I'm uh, have read uh, about social policies, how the government is struggling with it, grappling to know to the road ahead. We are very clear on what we want to do for the poor, for the middle class, for everybody in Singapore. And we are very sincere. You know why? Because we are sincere. It comes from the heart. For the PAP, it doesn't come from the heart. It's coming. It's because of survivor. They know that they have to do it to win back votes. It is their survivor that is the state. I don't think it comes from the heart. The heart is missing. We all this thing comes from our heart, and that's the difference. In fact, in, in, in psychology, the term is cognitive dissonance. They do one thing, but they feel in the opposite direction. The heart and the mind don't go together. Cognitive dissonance. Like you're seeing a lot of cognitive dissonance in the policy now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, you've got to answer that, David. Once we're approved, uh, by the registered societies. Uh, what we hope to do is actually build an education platform out there to organize seminars to tell people um, what our thinking is based on, the rationale, whether it's mathematical or economic, what's the basis, the fundamentals that's grounded on. So that would be the outreach program that we will have. This is purely an administrative uh, question, just to uh, be very clear. When did you all submit uh, you know, okay. the papers and, uh, you know, when do you all expect Okay, yeah, good, good point. Um, I think we will, rest, we will submit our registration uh, after this, and we expect the website says that approval will be given in two months. So you haven't submitted the registration? Yeah, I have not submitted so submit Yeah, we will submit either today or tomorrow. Uh, basically, why are we holding it now? Because we have been approached by a lot of our supporters. What are you going to do? Elections is, it seems to be coming around. I told them, no, like, it won't be so soon, you know? It will be next year, but they are so worried. They say, hey, are you ready and all? You know, all this, they are walking about. Why are you not walking about, you know? <laughs> so I think we want to assure our supporters that we, we are, this thing is all in the making, and we expect approval in two months, and then we will start walking about. And within these two months, we will be talking, there are a few things we will do. First, we will talk to the other parties to make sure that when we walk about, we have an understanding of the constituencies that we are going to, so that we don't overlap and we don't waste each other's time. And the second thing is that for specific policy papers, we will be within ourselves, we will be preparing policy papers for public consultation. And once it is approved, David has got a lineup of education seminars to bring it out for public consultation. 
policies like national service review, education. I think national service is an important thing. Two years is a long time, and it has taken, it has put Singaporeans at a disadvantage, especially one month of the service training. So we want to review that without compromising our defense capability. We need to have a hard look at it, a hard and frank look at it. Do not stop talking about vulnerabilities. We are aware it is our defense, our homes. We know what we are, uh, what we and what we want. Also, not to be disadvantaged. Do not disadvantage our young people uh, versus foreigners. All right. So. National service review is one thing. Education review, I think, is an important thing. We want education to be free, right from free school to university. Uh, will this cost a lot of money? Yes, it will cost a lot of money. It also costs a lot of money to give to tuition grants to foreigners. I think it costs us four hundred million dollar. With that four hundred million dollar, I think we can do. We can give free education at university to all Singaporeans. And why burden our people, our students, with student loans when they graduate? Are any one of you still paying your student loans? You are. We will not. Uh, we will not uh, burden our future students with student loan. They deserve a free education up to university. For postgraduate, I think uh, there are lots of postgraduate awards around universities. I don't think we want to. You know, you find. If you go to Europe, you go to Germany, even it's everywhere is free up to university. But postgraduate, you have to look money for your own. And I think Singaporeans deserve free education from preschool to university, and we can afford it. Now, I have one question, right? This is uh, pertaining to uh, you know, the topic about the heart. The topic about the people, right? Singaporean, local born Singaporean. Now, I've been thinking for many years, you see. Uh, you want a mic? Okay. No, I think it's Rahim. Okay, I've been thinking for many years, you see. Since school days, in the 70s. The last time was uh, in 1972. I stayed back person. I didn't ask this uh, one uh, candidate from uh, the Workers' Party. I remember this lawyer. It's very young lawyer, 24 years old. Now, I ask him, is there any way that a political party, you have a member of parliament, people's representative, all right? Now, is it possible that any other party in this Singapore context that we don't, we do away with party sweep, okay? We put on a sure mandate of a people's week. Now, what do you think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for this issue? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's a political party, they have to, it's part of discipline. So, I think obviously there is a place for conscience. I think the whip will be lifted. I think a number of times that whip has been lifted for allow members to speak their conscience. I think, was it, what issues was, was it the graduate mother issue or whatever, where the lift was uh, lifted. So, unfortunately, yeah, people's whip is the right way to go, but uh, that's not practical in the, in the framework of parliamentary political par uh, party politics. No, I think, I think it, it, it is, it's been all right, you know, if we change that kind of thing, you see? Now, we go back to people, constituents, the constituency you are elected by them, you see? Now, it is morally right that we ask them, what is your question for me to go to parliament? So why must we listen to the party? Right, we must listen to the people, we are not listening to the party. Party is our ticket in candidacy. But who elected us not party? The people's. Yeah. Right? Thank you. I hope the problem doesn't arise that the MPs really speak on behalf of the people so that there's no need for this. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Robert? Can I supplement that? Yeah. Uh, question. In fact, it's, uh, I believe it's the biggest uh, obstacle to our ongoing progress. Huh? That uh, 
the party after 15 years uh, has developed into a, into a legal dictatorship uh, where uh, if you say something that is uh, in, their, in their own interpretation uh, that is against a certain, certain law, they will charge you for something. They will catch you for sedition or harassment or whatever. And I think with the whole system being run on law, there is no more heart. The heart is black already. <laughs> so I believe that it's time to also talk about parliamentary authority. A parliament is elected by the people to serve the people, not to serve the party. So where the public interest is such that, for example, you want to, you want to open uh, Singapore into a 6.9 million population, right? You should not put the whip down. You should lift up the whip. But they are not going to do it for self-interest. So therefore, all this issue comes up, you see. So this gentleman actually is asking a question. And that question is today developed into a legal dictatorship where the Secretary General of the ruling party is a dictator. He is the one that decides, okay, who will get promoted, who will get this, who will get that. So because of this, we cannot progress. It's a stumbling block. We have to think about it. The only thing I can add is that we have to think out of the box. I think the ideas of people's whip, although it may seem quite elementary or quite unthought about, we must think out of the box. I don't remember going to a referendum in Singapore. I don't remember. And we are not interested in referendum. Referendum is almost like a people's whip. We go back to the people. Joining Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. But that's 1963. After that, no more. Uh, after 1963, no more, all the way until now. This is reluctance to go back to the people. Yeah. Like the white paper could have been a referendum. Yeah. So we, we've got to constantly think out of the box, see how well to govern Singapore and the feedback from the people. I tell you a simple example. They must be clear about their values. In the last GE, I mentioned homebound vehicles using the CTE at 10.30 p.m. they still collect money. Homebound vehicles, they're going home and around CTE. I said, what, what is this? What value are you transmitting? 1030 are still collecting money. You should be encouraging people to go home. I understand you want to stagger the going home time. But you don't stagger until 1030, maybe 830, maybe 8 p.m. 1030 p.m. That's a very simple example. If they say, Dr. Ang, why are you mentioning all this 5, 10, 10, 10 thing? Small, small thing. But it is this small thing that talk about values. If you are a government that value family life, value going home early, value having more children, you should be encouraging the people to go home early and not 10.30. Soon after that, they change it to 8.30. Reluctantly. <laughs> okay. So you're, you're right, you can't constantly think out of the box. When you see 10.30, the immediate reaction is, what can I do? There's nothing I can do. You can do a lot. You can write in, you can create some issue out of that, you know, and, but obviously alone they won't change. It took a GE, you know, a candidate mentioning it 10.30, then they change. So that is what I meant, we, we should constantly think out of the box and govern Singapore well. We are a lovely island, small lovely island. If we have limited number of people, optimal, I would say limited, optimal number of people living on this small island, we can create an oasis, a nice place to live in. Yeah. What do I do differently? In what sense? Campaigning. Okay. Actually, the 2011 general election was an eye opener for me, and in terms of logistics, I didn't have to do much. Uh, there was a party SDP with an excellent logistics organization. Did all the work. Uh, they did all the work, and. Uh, all that I did was to appear, make speeches, walk around. But this, like Dr. Ang as well, we were we were very grateful that the party was so efficient, did everything for us. We just come in last minute and then make speeches, walk around. This time round is different. This time round, I expect uh, I expect to do a lot of work, ground work. In fact, walk for the next two years until the next general election, uh, and then. Maybe I would have to look into logistics as well.
Okay. Any other question, Andre? I think we are quite specific. I think we all opposition have a common uh, anger in the sense that we are coming from the people, the effects of the people. BAP is always putting economic growth first. We are different. Uh, we emphasize more on the specifics, the economic part. I think I, think I have the advantage of being with government economic planning, I am more familiar with economic policy, uh, so I can say a lot. And I think, yes, they do have growing own table, local enterprises and all that. But I go further than that. I'm quite, you know, it's always, people will say, oh, without foreign workers, what do you know? Then there will be no economic growth. I challenge that. I don't take that because I know a lot about it. I did manpower planning too. I, 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 follow, I grapple with foreign worker issue. Right from my start in the uh, Ministry of Trade and Industrial Economics, I was uh, aide to Dr. Eusebius and all that. We all talk about foreign workers all the time. And whenever he comes, we go and see at TUC, the second, Mr. the G on, and we always talk, talk to him about foreign workers policy. So we are different in the sense, I think we are different from the other opposite parties in the sense we have the advantage of it. Someone like me who knows a lot more about the economy. So we are different. And the other thing different is that we are quite specific about these strong families. I know we can afford to have a child alive. I've been to Finland, you know, where the, there was a lady, a mother, who studied PhD. So by 4.30, she said, hey, I've got to go. I said, why, why, why? He said, oh, I've got to pick up my, my son. Uh, five o'clock, must pick up. And then go back. But she's so good. She said, oh, you know, she's allowed to do PhD and all that, and uh, look after children. 5 o'clock, say all free. Childcare facilities not free, but it's heavily subsidized, 80 90% subsidized. So they allow them, but preschool is free. By law, and by the age of three, you have to send your child to childcare facility, which is heavily subsidized. And after that, preschool is free. I mean, we can afford that. So I think opposition parties are afraid, have been taken to task by PAP all along. This will break up the economy, you will bankrupt the economy, you will break up the country, you ask for this, ask for that. I know what the figures are. And I know what the figures are from statistics, from official statistics. And I know we, they, they, have, they have gone away for too long. So we, it's different. We dare, for example, we are quite, we dare to put out very specific uh, increased child allowances and have a OH pension, we have unemployment insurance. And I've given you the figures. Well, um, we only do that after approval and then we will have our first meeting of the founding managers and we will decide among themselves who to do what. Patrick? Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Patrick. Good afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> you want to make? I think I can. Am I audible? Yeah, it's yeah. Okay, since I'm audible without a microphone, we've been talking about thinking out the box, referendums, and daring to do, and so on and so forth. This is a new party in the making, daring to do, daring to think out the box, etc. Et I think one of the issues which are close, is close to my heart and close to a lot of people's heart is the succession issue. I think for a long time we seem to be uh, clinging on to this conjecture that a prime minister must be off. Singaporean of Chinese descent. I think this is rather outmoded. I think Singapore has changed over the last 40 50 years, and I think it is time for us to make a change. To my mind, that is 
something which is quite an asset in the current cabinet. Now, I'm not trying to give advice to the current uh, government, neither am I trying to give advice to the new party in the making. But I feel that this someone that is in the cabinet is very sweet on the ground, and the ground is also very sweet on him. And he is someone that has a huge international reputation. Why should we waste this national asset? In preference to some rather wet in the years, behind the years, people who have only been there for about four to five years. They say, Hika, teach you. I think if such a person or such, I mean, without referring to this person specifically, I think it's uh, a general reference to the whole group. They're not quite ready. I don't expect too long. Would there be a case whereby the new party can perhaps start a little petition to petition that this succession issue be put to the people and ask the people whether they are ready for a Singaporean of non-Chinese descent? Put that to a referendum. Since you're new on the ground, okay? <laughs> and we want to test this out. And if, let's say, 50% or more feels that we, should, we, we have no problem with having this person, you know, from Taman Jurong and Taman from Taman Jurong, <laughs> I might as well say the word, become the next Thank Prime you. Minister. Uh, Patrick, okay, I'll finish. Okay. You know, the choice of Prime Minister is decided, decided by the party I know. the most majority. That's why I'm party. saying think out of the box, think okay. out of the parameters. If you are a new party, you have all the way without. To think okay. Yeah, the system. Okay. Better than mine, but you know, it's decided by the party. I know the that. Party of in I know that okay. the people <laughs> is more important than the party. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank sure. you. <laughs> Any questions? So, uh, everyone, is there anything? Huh? Okay. Before we end, maybe Robert. Maybe I can just. Just at one point, uh, the group, uh, what is being discussed last year, that uh, there is a sense of inevitability, inevitability uh, that Singapore must be run this way, must be run in a very tight manner. Everybody must be made into an economic digit, and everybody must follow the law. And the law is made by one man or a few men. I think this inevitability is a force to get out of. And uh, I believe that uh, one of the pro biggest problems here is that uh, we have allowed over 50 years uh, the one party to run a country uh, based on this box thing. The box is that we are vulnerable, like what Dr. Ang said. We don't have natural resources. We have to do things differently from the rest. I agree, but the thing is that they overstep the boundary. If you say nothing, tomorrow they will do almost anything uh, to serve that particular economic goal at the expense of the common people. And that is why today we are having so much problem everywhere. You know, and uh, many of these problems did not come up to you, you know. They are that hidden inside the heart of individual. And some of them have broken family, some of them have uh, actually divorces, all caused by one thing. They cannot survive in Singapore. So let's do something about this society. Don't accept the answer from one, from anybody that we are vulnerable. We must let them overtake the people and underpay the service, public services. And I, I think we have enough money. The money that mentioned by uh, Mr. Tan Chi Se is that we actually, if you take the whole lot of the direct and indirect taxes together, add them up and don't allow them to separate the annual account into two parts. Combine into one part, you will see that our surplus is hell of a lot, especially the land sale and the COE and ERP. Bring them all out, be transparent. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, any other thing before I round up? Any more questions for reporters? Uh, okay. Yeah. Online. online. There's provision for online now. So, yeah, 
Jadi kaki jalan tu dia. Ini kaki jalan. I was thinking just press the enter button. <laughs> After this press conference, we can do that. You want it now? Where's my phone? Now it's so easy, you know. But uh, some of you would have noticed you missed up on the. I just forwarded to you. Huh? Sorry. Uh, well, uh, we haven't come to that yet. <laughs> okay, maybe I round up by somebody. I thought somebody would ask, uh, will you succeed? How confident are you that you will succeed in your mission? My answer is, of course I'm confident. It will be a black swan. You know what a black swan is, right? Swans are supposed to be white until swan, black swans were discovered in Australia. So white swan, a black swan. A black swan is an unexpected event. So our success, we are confident that it will be a black swan. And why am I confident? Because we have seen many black swans in Singapore in the last few years. We have the first bus strike, we have the first riot in 40 years, and we have uh, the first escape of prison, high security prison and master Lamar, and we have Orchard Road floods. And the next election we will see the mother of all black swans. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Right? Anyone? Anyone slightly white swan? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you.